Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today in the last scientist webinar of the academic year, my favorite experiment, more local science. My name is Lorenzo Canu, and I'm a communications intern at the Science Education Department of European Schoolnet, and I'm talking today from the FCL. Together with us in the room today, we have my colleagues Rocio Benito and Giulia Lotina, who will be supporting this webinar from the technical side. If you have any technical issues, do not hesitate to let us know here in the chat. We will be happy to help. Before introducing our speaker and the start of this afternoon, Michael Gregory, let me briefly cover a few housekeeping rules. First of all, you will see that the Microsoft microphones and cameras have been disabled. So if you have any comments or questions for our speaker, we invite you to post them in the chat and we will address them at the end of each experiment if we are on time or during the last 10 or 15 minutes. Also, very important, do not forget to fill in the signature list that my colleague Julia will be sharing in the chat. This will ensure that we can continue to organize events like this in the future. In addition, only by filling these short forms, you will be able to receive a certificate of attendance in case you're interested. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Michael Gregory. Hello, uh, th thank you for that. Welcome, Lorenzo. Uh, and thank you to Lorenzo and everyone at Scientix for having me back for uh, another webinar. And thank you to everyone who's joining. There, there seem to be well over 100 of you joining from across Europe. And I'm thrilled. This, this has to be the most people I've ever had in my apartment to share experiments with. Um, so I'm quite thrilled uh, that everyone's taking the time and you're showing enthusiasm uh, as the weather gets warm and we're near the end of another school year and everyone's getting tired. Uh, so it's great to, to be here. Uh, you might remember me from some of the past uh, Scientix webinars I've given, also sharing a number of low-cost uh, uh, science experiments. And just like the past times, I'm going to start off by recommending you run around the house, grab a couple of simple materials if you haven't yet done so, if you want to follow along with that. Here's a list of simple materials. Um, again, I highly recommend you try and follow along in your own home with these experiments. If you miss any of them, they should be easy to repeat later on as well. So don't kill yourselves getting things. But as you go around trying to frantically grab materials, I'll briefly introduce who I am and what I'm going to talk about today. The, the big idea here is I'm going to go on a bike ride and I, see, I want to see who wants to meet me along the way. And I'll explain some of the details of that. Um, so for the past several years, I've had a project that I call My Favorite Experiments. And it, I, I guess now we can go on to the next slide. So I've been trying to meet as many teachers as possible, asking them to share their favorite experiments with, that, with me, and then sharing those forwards. Uh, those of you who know me well, either from past uh, Scientix webinars, from my monthly experiment share meetings, which I hope everyone wants to join. Uh, the next one is coming up Monday at 6. Um, whether it's through science on stage or something else, this might be a kind of familiar story. So I'm going to skip through things quickly. But I biked across my home country, Canada, 2017, meeting about 100 teachers on the way. Did something similar in Europe the next year in 20 different countries. Tried to share it forward both with my YouTube channel and a number of other things, volunteer teaching around the world. Uh, and then we got to the past couple of years where things have been a little bit more difficult to travel with the pandemic. Uh, things have been getting a lot easier. But in addition to going around in person trying to meet teachers, I've really upped what I'm doing online, in including this present webinar. Um, the last two years, one of the big things that's uh, come about in my life that's really made it a lot easier to connect with teachers are different teacher networks. Uh, so can we go to the next slide now? specifically Scientix. I've been a Scientix ambassador since January 2021, and it's been amazing. Uh, and Science on Stage, which is another very active network of teachers across Europe. I've been on Team France uh, since last September uh, for the Science on Stage Festival in 2000 in, in Prague in last month, it, not last month, in March. Uh, and just last week uh, at the annual meeting of the French team 
uh, I was named the Science on Stage France ambassador, which just for disambiguation, there's apparently two different distinctions, a European and a national one. I haven't been named anything at the European level, but I've been named by uh, Science on Stage France as their ambassador. So hopefully that'll help me connect with even more teachers. Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide as well? And we're almost ready to get to experiments. So hopefully anyone who was trying to grab equipment has it uh, already. Uh, so just to mention an, another, like one of the ways that I've been able to meet a lot of amazing teachers and get ideas from them are a monthly series of experiment shares. There's Zoom meetings. Anyone who's interested is welcome and encouraged to come along. Anyone who's interested in presenting an experiment can sign up to do so. Usually we have about eight to 12 different people, most of them from different countries, um, from all across Europe, sometimes one or two from Canada, United States, Brazil, kind of around the world. Um, and it's been my, my favorite source of new ideas recently. So some of the experiments I'm gonna to share today, uh, some of you might recognize if you've been along from some of the experiment shares, because I'll be sharing forwards experiments that other teachers have shared with me. If you're interested, the next one is coming up on Monday. There's a link that I, yeah, Julie has shared or will share in uh, the chat. Oh yeah, also the experiment shares were featured in the June issue of Science in School. And so now that it's 2022, now that I've been in touch with a lot of people across Europe through various networks and projects, then it's an, the most exciting time ever to get back on my bicycle and bike across a chunk of Europe. So. I, you'll notice I have a map there where it's actually the location of Scientix ambassadors. To point out, if you look, there's a lot in the south and a lot in the east. So if I want to go where there's eager science teachers who I might be able to connect with, it's probably best to stick to southeastern Europe. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I'll be starting in the south of France and Nice, making my way to uh, Geneva. Uh, yeah, I'll mention later. Um, but I'm going to a like science show festival in Geneva the first week of July. Then I'll be continuing. The route is kind of vague, so I haven't drawn a line yet, but I imagine I'll hit up Germany, Austria, which is along there, and then finishing in the Balkans in September, where with some people who I think are attending this webinar, I'm already starting to put things in place for a couple of conferences in Slovenia, uh, Serbia, and Bulgaria, and, and more things hopefully to come. Um, I think I've spent enough time talking. Now it's time to get on to the experiments. So we're going to turn off the slides now. So hopefully everyone will see me nice and big. And the first one we're going to do is one that comes from Bulgaria from my friend Nasco. Um, and if you've grabbed materials to follow along, grab a couple of sheets of toilet paper. And we're going to look at a little bit of introductory material science on toilet paper. And um, Oh, and I, I think I forgot to mention, but if there are questions, please, I, I think Lorenzo mentioned this, please ask them at any point. Um, they'll interrupt me or like probably Lorenzo will interrupt me, maybe Julia, uh, if anything seems worth interrupting me for. I'm a teacher, so I'm used to being interrupted. Um, the only kind of interruption I don't appreciate is if you're just asking to, do, to go to the bathroom, especially if it's a webinar, just go, you don't need to ask me. Okay, so first thing is grab one sheet of toilet paper. And you'll notice there's two different sides. When, when I tore it off, I guess I should go back to hold where I tear it off. So I tear it off. Oh, perforations were up high. And there's one set with perforations. And you can see it's got like little bumps on it from where it was connected together. In most cases, as is my case, it's the shorter side and the longer side is the other way. So I want you to start by holding it. Make an L with your finger, an L with your other finger, hold it carefully up in the middle, and I'm going to count down from three, and then I want you to try and tear it apart. Three, two, one. And it should, like it did for me, have torn, torn nice and easily. This is one where it's awesome if people have webcams on for, like there's over 100 views, so we can't do that, but Hopefully you're holding two fairly even pieces of toilet paper there. It ripped along the length of the fibers. Next, I want you to take a second sheet, hold it the other way, so with the flat edge up at the top. And with the flat edge at the top, hold it with one finger, hold it with the other finger. Three, two, one. 
It didn't rip straight for me. Hopefully it didn't rip straight for you. If it did, add that in the chat and then we'll see like how many people weren't holding it wrong or how many countries have obscure toilet paper. Uh, but the reason why this happens is that the toilet paper is made from wood pulp. So they ground up trees and they ground it up into a fine pulp and then they squish it together and then they extrude it between big metal rollers. The big metal rollers you can kind of picture using toilet paper rolls and it squeezes it out in between in the long direction. And that makes a long sheet of toilet paper, which then they perforate out afterwards to separate. And the fibers will run down that length. And we can see evidence of the fibers running that way, but not this way. So fiber is only running this way. And it has a sense along which way it'll easily tear. The, <clears throat> the next thing I want you to do, grab a new uh, sheet of toilet paper. And again, with the perforations up top, I just want you to crumple it, but crumple it without twisting it. So you should have like a fairly tight package, but you haven't twisted around, like no twisting around like that, just tight package like that. And then try and pull it apart. Three, two, one. And it should come apart fairly easily. But the next thing we're going to do Take the same, well, another piece of toilet paper, hold it the same way, but this time twist it around. And keep turning it and twisting it until it gets really tight. It'll get to a point where you won't be able to twist it more without it kind of turning into a ball. So once you get to the point where it's at a maximum level of twisting, so you see now that's like ni nice and tightly wound. And now when I try and pull that apart, it's a lot harder. I'm strong, so I can eventually get it. But it's a lot harder because the twisting motion is push the fibers together. And then the friction between the fibers is much harder because it's being pushed down. And they can't easily slide against each other. So it holds it together and it gives it extra force uh, that way. So that's two simple things that we can do to look at how uh, the, the fibers of toilet paper are there. The, the next thing we're going to do is look at the optical properties of the toilet paper. So here, um, I, I have a sheet of paper. I want everyone in the chat now, if you have toilet paper and you're following along, can you write what color is your toilet paper? That way we can have a sample of toilet paper colors across Europe. I have a guess what most people will, uh, will be writing. But just to see who's paying attention and who's following along with toilet paper, what color is your toilet paper? Take a second to write that in the chat. So far, I'm not getting anyone telling me their toilet paper color. Everyone seemed eager to say hi and where they were from, but no one really seems eager to uh, mention the toilet paper color. Maybe that's a little bit too private of a question. We actually have quite some answers with the white, white, white with blue dots, with green lines. Probably. Really? Maybe my chat is lagging behind. OK. Gray. Hi from Romania. White. OK. Peach. Uh, excellent. So there's, there's a couple of different colors, and it seems the predominant one people are citing is white. And so I'll, I'll go out on a limb, and I'll say that most people perceive most of their toilet paper to be white. And if it has another color, it's because it has another dye that's been added to it so we can see another color. Now, the next thing I'm going to say may be surprising to some of you, but toilet paper is made of cellulose fibers, and cellulose doesn't interact with visible light. So it should be transparent. But it's not transparent. I, I don't think anyone has transparent toilet paper there. And the reason for that is because of the interface between the toilet paper and the air. And if we look at a different uh, object, like glass is transparent. I have a drinking glass here. But if you look at things like the edge of the glass, the edge and the bottom, when you look at parts where light is bouncing uh, back or in different directions rather than just going straight through, we have a whitish tinge to it. And we often represent transparent things as white. Um, so if it's changing medium from air to something transparent back and forth, 
then light will tend to be scattered in a whitish color if it's evenly scattering all colors. We'll see another experiment related to that near the end. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the air out of the way. And to do that, I'm, I've put one sheet of toilet paper in a tray on my desk down here. And I'm just going to take a drop of vegetable oil. And you could use any oil for this. I didn't tell you to do this part at home because it gets a little bit messy and I don't want anyone blaming me for spilling oil all over the computer. But I'm just going to pour the smallest amount I can because I want to contain my mess as well. And a small amount that's now spreading through that paper. The paper is now becoming transparent because instead of going from cellulose to air to cellulose to air to cellulose to air to cellulose to air as it makes its way through the fibers, it just goes from air to the cellulose oil mixture all the way through to my experiment share sticker on the other side. So you should be able to see now clearly through the hole in the oil, if I don't take it off camera, you should be able to see uh, through the toilet paper where it's been covered in oil. And again, if there was no oil there, you don't see through it and becomes transparent as it goes through the oil. Um, that's three quick experiments on toilet paper. Uh, in the chat, let me know if you're eager to see one more before I move on to a different set of experiments. There's one on strength testing um, that's interesting to do. While waiting to see if anyone mentions uh, that they'd like to see another toilet paper one, Again, that one was one that was shared to me by an amazing science teacher in Bulgaria, Nasko Staminov, and I'm eager to go to see him in Sofia for the Sofia Science Festival near the tail end of my bike trip. So again, if you want me to invite, if you want to invite me anywhere interesting, one of the reasons I'm sharing this ex uh, these experiments is to show that's how I get new experiments. I'm looking for more and more places to share them forward. So yes, some people said they want more uh, toilet paper experiments. So one more one, which is for strength testing and comparing toilet paper with paper towel. I'll show this setup for it. Um, yeah, I'll, it'll go fairly quick, so I'll probably show with paper towel as well. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a water glass here, and I'm just going to lower the camera again. So water glass, one sheet of toilet paper, an elastic band covering it. So it's being held over the top of the glass, hopefully fairly tightly, ideally without ripping. If, if you rip it trying to set this up, then just replace the piece of toilet paper. I mean, most of us uh, flush a whole bunch of sheets of it down the toilet any, anyway, so if you lose one or two for an experiment, it's not necessarily that big of a waste. Okay, so what? This worked well when I was practicing an hour ago. <laughs> it really shouldn't be that hard to put a sheet of toilet paper over a water glass. Of course, when doing this in class and getting students to do so, if you don't expect them to be as coordinated as you are, get them to work in pairs. There, it's staying on there. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet the toilet paper to demonstrate one of the properties of toilet paper. And I'm just going to wet it lightly. And we see water spreads out across the whole thing. Now I'm going to grab a stack of coins. And a lot of you will use euros where you are, so euro coins will be familiar. It doesn't matter which coins you use, as long as you use the same coins or same sets of weight when you're comparing different, um, different papers. And I'm just going to start stacking on coins. So here's two cents, four cents, Six cents, eight cents, ten cents. So far, it's holding ten cents. Eleven, going one by one because it's starting to sag. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and it held fourteen cents before the toilet paper broke. And if we compare that to paper towel, my hypothesis, and really. It's, um, kind of an obvious hypothesis because I've done this before, but my hypothesis is the paper towel will hold a significantly higher amount of weight. And the reason for that is toilet paper. It's designed to be flushed down a toilet and go through a sewer system. If it, if it stayed strong while wet, then it'd actually be a problem 
because then we'd have a very strong, um, very strong set of uh, fibers in a toilet, uh, in a sewer system, which would cause blockages that are harder to break. We see this easily stays on with 14 cents. I've misplaced my other stack of coins, so I'm just going to start putting on other pieces of equipment, like a washer, which is clearly heavier, a candle, other things. And we can see we can actually stack a surprisingly large amount of stuff on top of a wet paper towel, and it's designed to keep its strength uh, while wet. And th this one I picked up is a series of experiments actually run by Don Rathjen at the Exploratorium in San Francisco. And it, uh, it was part of a series where you could compare several different brands of toilet paper, uh, facial tissue, uh, paper towels. But we can see a shocking difference in the, dif uh, in the fiber strength between paper towel and toilet paper. Uh, OK, so I think that's enough of playing with toilet paper. Um, are there questions on these experiments before I move to a couple of other experiments on different topics? And, and Lorenzo, will you relay things from the chat so I don't need to keep my eye on everything? Sure. We have um, two questions. The first one is from Alice, which, which asks what kind of paper we can use to compare the results, which I believe quite goes in the direction of talking about the difference between kitchen and toilet paper, and what happens with the napkins. And again, from Alice, if I use hot water or cold water, the result changes. These three questions. Ah, so so my first answer to that is an answer that they, they often give at the Exploratorium, and that's the best answer to any question is an experiment. So play around with it and try out. Uh, but that being said, like I was using it to show the difference between how any paper towel brand will be stronger than any toilet paper when wet, because that's how they're designed. One's designed to fall apart when wet, the other's designed to hold up together. Um, but with students, I've bought one roll of 10 different brands, and we've compared different characteristics of brands, like their strength when wet, their strength when dry, their absorbency, like with different tests where you could measure the mass of the paper towel when it's dry, the mass when it's wet. Uh, they could rate it based on comfort. Um, they could evaluate how much they might end up using depending on their use for it. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you could test. Um, and again, I worked that into a material science part, which was part of a like bigger topic when we were studying uh, structure and materials like bridges and bu bridge building contests, uh, towers. Um, but into the materials part, just bringing that in as one case of applied material science. Uh, I think that answered all the parts of the question. Did I miss any of them? Uh, no, it uh, it was fine. Perhaps uh, we can move to the next uh, experiment. Perfect. So the next couple of experiments, and actually right on cue, I was filling my water glass, and it's going to use water. And these are going to be a couple of ones on surface tension. So the first one is going to take the form of a challenge. So, and again, follow along at home if you have a uh, a water bottle cap, like this is one from a water bottle, like this bottle of water here. Yeah, it's not really framed very well. And just a glass of water, and I'm going to drop the water cap in. And you'll notice that if I leave it, the cap will eventually move to the side of the glass. And I managed to get that pretty close to the middle, so it's taking a moment to do it, but without touching it, it eventually gets a little bit close to one side. And as it gets closer, it speeds up and it's actually attracted to the sides. And we can see that I might not put it like fully in the middle again, but we can see if it's close to one side, it sticks to that side. And anyone following along at home, you should see the same effect unless you have a hydrophobic glass. And so the two questions are, why does this happen? And how, how can we get it uh, to stop going to the side? Or how can we get the bottle cap to stay near the middle of the glass. And this is something that you can challenge students to try and work out. And you can give them a, a fair bit of time for this and they'll try different things out. Um, does anyone have any guesses they want to put in the chat? And I, I think those of you who have been along to maybe the January experiment share might have seen me share this one. So there should be at least a couple of people who are familiar with this. But 
And any guesses either why it sticks to the side or how we can get it to go in the middle? The most answer, the most sent answer here, you will fill the entire glass or fill up the glass. Excellent. So let's try that. And that that's probably people have identified that in the glass there's a meniscus. And hold this up a little bit better so I can. So with the meniscus, the water will come up towards the side because of uh, adhesion between water and the glass. And you'll actually see it climbs up further at the side when you see like the edge of it up like that. So all I need to do to get it in the middle is to fill the glass excessively full, have the cap float in the middle, because the meniscus now will be where the water is stuck to the sides of the glass and the level of water will be higher than the glass itself, unless I spill it out the outside. And so the cap now tends towards the middle because the shape is rounded from the top downwards. This relates to the next one. Hopefully everyone's satisfied with this being in the middle enough. It's kind of circling near the middle and it's getting closer and closer. Uh, but now I'm going to drink it down. And put a pair of bottle caps in this Frisbee. And fun fact, this Frisbee uh, works well as a dish and I'm going to be taking it with me on my bike trip across Europe and it's going to be my plate when I'm camping different places or picnicking different places because it's made of plastic and it like plastic is shatter resistant. So I've eaten a lot of meals off of this same plate that I'm experimenting with now. And you'll see the two bottle caps, they'll stick together and tend to follow each other around. We can add more bottle caps to it, and you'll see they'll tend to spontaneously float together and form islands and stick to each other, all because of surface tension. And, oh no, sorry, all because of uh, adhesion between the water and the bottle caps. And this effect I first came across from Paul Doherty at the Exploratorium, and he was doing this in the context of Cheerios, a popular breakfast cereal, at least popular in the United States, and he was demonstrating how they all stick together. And we can look at a converse of this. If I float paper clips, so these are just regular paper clips, although I learned the hard way, this is not the kind of paper clip they have in Spain. In Spain, they have a nice bump, so it works better for getting papers but it's absolutely awful for uh, surface tension experiments. So I can float paper clips on the surface tension of the water, and we'll see that paper clips will be repelled by bottle caps, but will be attracted by other paper clips. So we get these islands of positive and negative. Uh, one is floating above the water, the bottle caps, and the paper clips, because of surface tension, they're not sinking but they're lower than the surface of the water. So we can see attraction and repulsion. Now, one more thing I'm gonna to add to that is if I add static electricity into the equation, so I'm gonna take a drinking straw, which unfortunately are being phased out in much of Europe because people were only using them to uh, drink beverages and not for experiments. So we can see static electric attraction by inducing an opposite charge. However, when we get to the paper clips, I'm just going to get these bottle caps out of the way for this, well, hopefully without sinking all the paper clips. We see the paper clip is actually pushed away from the charged uh, straw, which is very unusual until you think about this. And this was an effect that was shown to me by Ivan Lomachenko at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Russia. The paper clip is repelled by it. Whereas simple induction doesn't explain that because induction is always an attractive force. Uh, the explanation for this is actually it attracts the water just as much as it attracts the paper clip. And by attracting the water, it raises up slightly higher, which has a net effect of pushing the paper clip away. Uh, so, that, like, that's something I like having fun with surface tension there. Uh, I, Think, yeah, I'm going to move on to two more with surface tension. 
Just one, one other uh, final one on the topic of uh, surface tension. So here I have a bottle of water. And this is one shown uh, to me or taught to me by my friend Paul Nugent in Ireland. Uh, and here I have a bottle cap with a hole in it. So things should be able to pass through. For example, this drinking straw can pass all the way through it. However, However, when I turn the bottle of water upside down, the, the water doesn't come out. Unless, of course, I squeeze the bottle and then I can let water come out. Not only that, but things can pass through. So I'm going to grab a couple of bits of straw. Keep ducking off camera to grab more equipment. And so I can demonstrate that the hole still is indeed a hole. And I can put through bits of straw, but water won't spontaneously fall out through the hole because surface tension is enough uh, to keep water in when it's only a couple millimeter gap. Uh, I think I'm going to finish off with, uh, like, if that's all I'm going to show for surface tension. If anyone has questions, let me know, and then I'm going to show a couple of invisible inks. Yeah, we're perhaps running a bit uh, long, so we, we're going to gather all the questions and we're going to use them later. Oh, okay, perfect. So we'll wait till the end for the questions. So I'll move straight on to two kinds of invisible ink. Well, they're, yeah, depending how you look at it, they're not technically invisible, but they're disappearing or you can selectively view them. Um, okay, so the first one, and I'm going to check if the other camera can go on because it'll be easier to have my hands free for this. Does my, now can you see me? Are things not frozen with that camera or are they fro frozen again? It gets a bit pixelated, if that's the term. Uh, we can see you, but it's you're in danger of freezing. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, no, okay. <laughs> not not an inter insurmountable problem. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll leave that be for now. And here <laughs> I'm showing these uh, friction pens, which are certainly popular in France. They may or may not be in your country. And they're a kind of thermochromic erasable uh, ink. So we can see my favorite experiments written on this paper. If I rub the eraser, we can rub out letters there. But the reason that these ones work is because of a thermochromic ink that has a lot of interesting science behind it, because it works essentially as a reversible crystallization uh, and melting, crystallization or dissolving uh, reaction uh, with a pH indicator that activates an ink. Um, I actually made a video of this for my YouTube channel during the first week of the lockdowns in 2020. But I'd kind of forgotten about it. To the team the camera. Uh, so I'd kind of forgotten about it uh, for a couple of uh, a, a year or two until uh, a teacher from Scotland, Adrian Allen, showed this uh, on one of my experiment shares. And then I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I do like uh, how this one works. And there's a lot more detail to the science than I'm going to go into just demonstrating it now. But we can see. We can see if I use the heat of a candle, then I can also erase it. And to show it's a reversible reaction, after it's erased, I'm going to put it in a free in uh, my freezer. And in the 15 minutes or so before the end of this webinar, it should be able to reappear. So there I've erased uh, this friction ink just with the heat of a candle. I'm going to set it aside in a freezer and then get to a second kind of uh, disappearing ink. Okay, and this, this second kind, <coughs> this is uh, just regular highlighters, like fluorescent highlighters. Uh, we can see a couple of colors of ink there. And um, 
Uh, Pardon. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to use a colored flashlight for this. So a colored flashlight is something that most of you probably don't have at home. And I actually didn't have until a day or two ago. Uh, and I ordered it specially for my new science show, which I'm going to be sharing on this bike trip at any schools who want to invite me. Uh, but you can use uh, fixed lights that are colored lights or extreme low cost version of this. If you have a laptop, iPad or phone, you could just uh, put on a single color with the pixel and you have a low power monochromatic light there. I'm going to put this whole setup inside of a box, which was actually the stand I was using uh, my computer on. And I'm going to look through the camera in this hole. Things should be lined up so we can see through into the box and we can see my favorite experiments, just getting things lined up through the hole, nice and bright. And then if we look in different colors, we'll notice the red doesn't get anything to fluoresce. So we see things like the orange that only has a yellow phosphor will be faded out by the, trying to centralize that. I didn't make the hole big enough, it appears. Let's enlarge it last minute. There we go. So again, only seeing what colors are either fluorescing or blocking out ink. And this is one that I like to use for students to uh, order the uh, spectrum of light by color, because often we can do it kind of unintuitively by wavelength or by breaking things into the rainbow. But if they're given the principle that to fluoresce, uh, uh, phosphor needs to be hit by light with a pigment that's uh, uh, of a higher energy, then by looking at which colors of uh, phosphor fluoresce and which colors of light, they can easily get that red is the least energetic on the visible spectrum, blue is the most energetic, green's kind of in the middle, uh, and so on. Uh, looks like it's quarter to six, so we have about 15 minutes left. There's two experiments I'm going to finish with. Um, one, those of you who were Oh, only that camera. I'm, I'm going to see if the other camera works for uh, this next one. If it doesn't, that'll affect the choice of experiments. Am I pixelated and not very visible again with, with my main camera? Now it's fine. Now we can now see it's it. Fine? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I, I will show the card scope again. So those of you who uh, joined me last February uh, will have seen me use this cardboard microscope attachment in the uh, in the context of looking at face masks. Now I'm going to use it to look at the screen of a smartphone to look at primary colors of light. So uh, what I've done is I've just mounted a simple lens on a piece of cardboard. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this one is to tell a story and to make an offer. So uh, the same offer I made a year and a half ago, February 2021, still stands. Anyone who uh, sends me a picture of uh, themselves repeating any of the experiments you've seen me share, I'll send you 10 lenses so that you can make a class set of your own microscopes like this. And the story I wanted to share behind that is that this led to a couple of pretty interesting teachers around Europe contacting me following my first Scientix webinar. I'm talking while trying to do this and not doing a good job of either. Uh, anyways, one of them ended up being a teacher in Ireland uh, named Paul, who was heavily involved in science on stage. And after we got in touch, uh, him taking my, uh, me up on my offer to send lenses, then we stayed in touch and he encouraged me to get involved with science on stage in my own country. And if it weren't for that offer to um, share lenses, I never would have gotten in touch with him. Okay, uh, 
Okay, finally, <laughs> holding things by hand because my elastic bands wouldn't work. Uh, you should be able to see a blurry little hole uh, through which I'll be able to get a magnified image of whatever I look at on the other side, including right now, millimeter graph paper. And in the chat, can people type roughly how many millimeter squares fit across this screen? And let's go left to right because it's slightly more narrow left to right than up to down. Just to check that we're on the same page here. Let's see how, how many people tend to say. Okay, five, perfect. So approximately five squares fit across there. Now, okay, free hand again. For some reason, my elastic band is not holding this in place today. Okay. Now I'm going to use it to look at the screen on a smartphone. And we'll notice when I get nice and zoomed in, we should be able to That really today is just not my day for this. OK, we, we can see the grid of pixels coming in. It's hard to get them resolved into individual colors. Yeah. Trust me, this normally works a lot better. So, uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll leave this one to the teachers to try, and we'll finish with one uh, one last experiment. And I th I think the pinhole one, we'll skip that one just in the interest of time. The very last one will be the one for which I recommended ouzo pastis or milk, and that one I'm going to go outside for that one. Uh, to show with the beautiful sunlight on a very hot day in Paris. I, I don't know if you can see while I'm doing this, but I'm sweating buckets. Uh, so going outside to appreciate the beautiful sunlight. Okay, outside on a Parisian balcony looking at the skyline behind me. And this last one now is going to involve a water bottle a drinking glass, and either milk, pastis, or ouzo. Okay, and this is an attempt to answer the age-old question, why is the sky blue? So, uh, mentioning more great teachers across Europe, this is a bottle of ouzo from my friend uh, in Crete, uh, Astrinos Tutsudakis, who is also a, a Science on Stage ambassador. And as you can see, it's a clear colorless liquid. And I'm going to pour it into this glass. And when I add water, which is another clear colorless liquid, watch what happens. And it's, it's a good example of an interesting change that can happen. So you'll notice, uh, and I might need to add a little bit more so you notice it a little bit more clearly. Two clear colorless liquids combine to give now a cloudy one. And I'm going to fill the glass up. This is fuller than you do, and it's more dilute than you do if you were simply just going to drink it. But so that we can see throughout the glass, already the reaction that's going on, this isn't like it's a physical change rather than a chemical change. And it's that there are essential oils which are soluble in the ouzo because of the high alcohol content. When diluted in water, the solubility drops, so it turns to an emulsification with a droplet size on the order of one micron. The interesting thing with that, when we get to the physics of it, so already the, like the physical chemistry, the chemistry of it coming out of solution forming an emulsion, but the droplet size is just bigger than the wavelength of visible light. And because it's near the same order of magnitude, then it scatters light um, in interesting ways. We can see that as well with a bottle of milk, uh, well, a bottle of water with a couple drops of milk in it. But two or three things I want to point out with the color of it. 
if you look at the color, uh, well, and I'm going to use the second camera for this part. If you look at the color, then let, let me, okay, that's my face. Uh, okay, if you look at the glass, held up against the blue sky, you'll notice it looks a yellowish color. Whereas if you look at it, looking the other way, you'll see it looks a bluish color. And it's not that the actual color of it is changing, but it's that it experiences Tyndall scattering, where similar to Raleigh scattering, why the, why the sky is blue, blue wavelengths will be preferentially scattered out uh, before it gets through the medium. Whereas afterwards, so, sorry, so more yellow light, uh, <laughs> losing my words in the, in the explanation. Okay, so so <laughs> blue light, and if we look at it from the side, it kind of becomes more clear like that. So on the side, the sun's on, it'll look more blue. On the other side, it'll look more yellow because blue light is scattered more strongly because it has a shorter wavelength. Uh, same thing if we look at the bottle, bottle with a couple of drops of milk, we can see it's a little bit more blue towards the sun side and more yellow towards the non-sun side uh, because of the optical properties of pasties and milk. Uh, so that was the final experiment uh, that I'm sharing. Now we finally get to, oh, now we finally get to my last couple of slides that I'm going to rush through and then any remaining questions. Can I as we get back to the, the slides, what I'm going to mention here is that as I make my way across Europe, I'm eager for people, especially teachers, but really anyone who wants to meet me, <laughs> feel free to get in touch with me, but uh, especially to visit schools and science centers and different things that it could include are anyone who wants to invite me to present at a conference. Uh, I've already got a couple invitations to present at different conferences on the way. Um, anyone who wants to invite me to run a workshop at your school or in your local area. As I mentioned before, I'm uh, writing a new science show that I'm going to be testing out along the south of France starting on Monday uh, in Mougin, which is near Nice and Cannes, making my way to Geneva. And if you have a science club or any students who want to share experiments with kids around the world, my YES International meetings are perfect for that. Also, if I'm not going to your school, um, that, like most of it's online. Um, uh, experiment share meetings, like the next one I'm hosting from the Mougin International School on Monday. Uh, and then the two last things, like slightly more detail on that. My new workshop series, Science on Your Stage, was inspired um, by trying to get people initially just from the Science on Stage Festival, but expand because really it, like anyone who has something interesting to share, you're welcome. And these are hybrid workshops where I spend a third of the time leading experiments myself, a third with friends around Europe joining uh, to share experiments via Zoom, and a third trying to get the people uh, who show up in, in, like locally for the workshop to share things with each other and with me. Uh, I was piloted in Serbia. The first one was piloted in Serbia last year, uh, last month, and I'm hoping to do a lot more in different places I visit. Uh, and then the last, uh, like the next slide, which is one of the last things I want to talk about, is my brand new science show that uh, I'm testing out in schools and happy to do it at your school if you want to invite me if I'm near, in your area. Uh, and then finally, the very last slide is how to find out more information both about where I'll be, when I'll be, uh, as I bike across Europe trying to share experiments, uh, how I'll share some of that forward, both with its uh, blog series on the Scientix blog and on my YouTube channel. Uh, so if you're interested, please get in touch with me. Uh, and hopefully that leaves a couple of questions, uh, a couple of minutes left for questions before we need to leave. Thank you very much, Michael, for the timely ending, and thank you for this information. We share throughout the webinars your contacts so that people can contact you and reach out to you. We also noted some questions. I believe that we are going to scan them a bit to check the ones that we can fill in the last couple of minutes. Uh, we have one, which is how we can will contact you. Um, one. Two are uh, related to the experiments 
and uh, yes, so mainly they are related to the experiments. Perhaps they can send them uh, to you directly. And if you have any more questions, you perhaps can leave them in the chat. I mean, also, I mean, it's worth it's worth saying that a lot of people are saying thank you. This was a great activity. We'll definitely join the next webinar. We are looking forward to have you. So congratulations. The, the public really loved this this uh, webinar. And some excellent and exciting presentation. But perhaps someone has a question. Uh, I have one, by the way, which is actually about an experiment while we're waiting for one. Uh, in the first one, the one with the cap and the tension on top of the water, um, you someone said to fill up the glass in order for the cap uh, to stop, uh, you know, going around or going to the sides. But what if we used the soap in order to break the tension of the water? Would that work too? Ah, oh, that's that, that's a great idea and. That should work quite well. Uh, it's not foolproof, but usually that'll work. And actually, that that relates to troubleshooting. If it doesn't work, like if anyone was trying it and the bottle cap wasn't sticking to the side of the glass, the two reasons why that sometimes happens: if the glass wasn't well rinsed after it was washed with a lot of dish soap, because um, even a little bit of soap can drop the surface tension enough, uh, or if the glass is of like a hydrophobic material, like some plastic cups, you'll see water beads on. And so it might not climb up on the sides like that. So you might not have the effect there as well. Uh, but soap definitely, can, well, soap usually works to get it to stop going to the side, um, except a couple of times when it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Well. In this case, uh, it's uh, six sharp. Uh, I'm, proud we, I'm proud we made it to finish on time. So thank you once again, and thank you for all your great ideas. Uh, of course, we at Scientix, we all would like to wish you a wonderful trip across Europe, and we hope that you're going to meet a lot of Scientix ambassadors. If you want to know more about them, that is the Scientix Ambassador Visibility Campaign. And especially to our attendees, uh, again, on behalf of Scientix, I wish you all a good and refreshing period of holidays. We are looking forward to seeing you again in September for more webinars and activities. But if you cannot wait until September, please let me uh, invite you to take a look at the second episode of the all new Scientix TV, where you'll also find an experiment section at the end of each episode. So thank you, Julia, if you could share the link in the chat. And again, thank you from the chat, from a lot of happy people. And uh, see you again in September then. So I'm going to close. We I was also zero zero shared it. So thank you very much. And we will stop now presenting the webinar. Have a nice holidays. <laughs>